Hello. M12 Warthog back. Back here again. It's been a while since I've uploaded, but I've been dealing with stuff IRL. But I'm making a video now, and today I figured I'd do something a little bit different. I want to do a new take on my series where I do strategy stuff with video games and all that stuff. But generally, this video is going to be a little bit different. Normally, I do a commentary while I'm playing the game. This is going to be after I play. Because right now, I'm going to be putting myself against three AIs on a free-for-all map. So, 3v1. And I'm going to set it up similar to that and try and recreate the scenario of... How should I say this? Recreate the scenario of a, of a multiplayer battle I had last night in this game. Now, I will say, though, this game was fun to play, and I did come out on top despite being in a 1v3, not to brag. But I want to talk about and use this video to essentially capture what went on. So... Now, for the do, host edit me is going to be, uh, or, or, host recording me, who's editing this, he is going to be talking throughout the whole thing, explaining some stuff, probably throwing some references to Battle of Marengo, and, uh, some stuff from the book, The Art of War. Great book, by the way. <laughs> you should totally read it. And so forth. All right. Now, for the do, I'm going to strip commentary of post at recording me once I'm done. Okay. For this, we'll just assume they were at least normal. We'll just go with normal for now. We're going to have one that is land. I'm going to make them all light colors and me a dark color. It's going to be easier, I think, for the views. Now, if memory serves correct, I believe one was Cybran, one was Illuminant, and then the other one was Illuminant, but, okay, yeah. Alright, normal, and... I know the Cybran went to... I believe? Was the Illuminant? No, no, the Cybran went air, the other two went land. Okay, so, this one's... going to be land. And this one is going to be normal, custom, and this one's going to be air. That's there. Fabron went air, the other two were luminate, and so forth. No, for this, we did kind of agree, because I was on a 1v3, that we would have all researching units unlocked for this mission. I guess they wanted a little bit of a faster time, but they also wanted a 20-minute rush timer, just, I don't know, to set up stuff. Maybe they wanted me to, like, not whittle them down as they go along, so that they could all raid me at 20 minutes. Probably that, maybe they were thinking of something else that I didn't foresee that I somehow squashed. Or I could learn what they did. You know, sometimes there are some downsides to having good tactics. But, let's get into this. Enjoy the rest of my annoying voice with post-recording me. Okay, for starters here, what I'm going to do is build out a massive amount of energy generators. This is more similar to the scenario we did. We did not have research in this one, but we did have no DLC too. So we have everything unlocked that you could get unlocked by DLC. Not by DLC, but um, research. As you can see, I prioritize building energy generators first because we can mass convert later on. This will become key and handy. Then we have over here our air setup because this is going to be important in a 3v1 you want to go air because it's going to be the most mobile especially on a map like this now here's the thing right now i'm at numbers three to one so if you think about it the enemy does not have enough numbers to surround us they do not have enough to attack us their best option is to divide us 
And air power is great because I can attack some and then move quickly back to where I need to to prevent them from being able to divide us too much, if anything. At least until we get the defense grid that I want to implement later on, which you'll see. Of course, to ensure that if we have about even numbers that I'm always superior and always taking air battles, I'm going to have all the AA gun emplacements I want and have enough of them to ensure this. But I do believe by default they do attack the enemy fighters first, so they immediately focus fire first the enemy's air-to-air uh, -air combat, giving you the numbers to uh, be able to fight back their air force. Meanwhile, the rest of their units are probably just going to try and bomb you, but if you build enough shields to protect you against uh, long periods of uh, long-range artillery shelling, you, you sh usually should be fine. Now, the reason I put those energy generators there is to leave room underneath, below them, to add in a nuke defense silo and a uh, and a few long-range artillery emplacements. But the main thing here, though, is that you want to have a good spread of nukes, nuke defense silos. If you have, like, less than four, you're probably not doing it right unless you have an extremely small compact base. Well, I have two rows of hard points I'm setting up here. I'm going to put two AA guns on each row on either side, so that's a total of eight. Four on one side, four on the other, and so forth. And this is important. Not only that, but it makes it harder for air units to take out something that is going to literally prevent me from being divided by land forces. Now, as Sun Tzu says in his Art of War, you honor an opponent 10 to the enemy's 1, you surround them, 5 to the enemy's 1, you attack them, 2 to the enemy's 1, you divide them. If you have about equal numbers, but you know you are spear, you may take the battle. If in fear, avoid battle at all costs. So I'm trying to make sure that in air battles, the the engineering towers on my energy generators, the AA guns, give me that advantage, even if we're on equal numbers, and so forth. And this is going to become key and important. Now, another thing that's going to help me prevent us from being divided is I'm going to be building a row of shield generators starting from the middle of the two, starting from behind the middle of the two rows of hard points right here, going back eight long. The first four on either side will have a total of four short-range artillery replacements for a total of 32. This will be key and important. So now, as as this will pretty much prevent anyone from coming across the bridge over here and completely trying to destroy us with land units. Not to mention, these units can actually be set up to uh, go to uh, to a different firing mode, which will instantly annihilate in seconds. And I mean seconds, like even uh, King Crypt or uh, experimental units. So. We gotta know when to make use of that, but also it's important to have a lot of energy because it takes about, I believe it's like 16,000 uh, energy just to convert all 32, so. So this is how you 1v3 on a four-way free-for-all map. Prevent yourself from being divided, making sure you can put yourself in a position to where you cannot lose, and then when the enemy, by their own actions, present you the opportunity to take them unprepared, you take it. Whittle down their army, guerrilla tactics, do whatever. As long as you can ultimately get a 1v5 to attack them back, at least enough to divide them without taking away f enough forces that would leave your base undefended, you usually should be good. As you can see, I have about five here. And then I put down a sixth one. Usually I go with five to six. Now, this is accurate in the fact that I did set it up 
in a way that was more accurate to the 1v3 I did. I just happened to not be recording at the time. But I'm recreating it for educational purposes of applying strategies to video games. So, in this situation, we are 7 minutes and 40 seconds in. We agreed to at least do a 20 minute timer. It's these randos I ran into. But anyway, watch this. Having artillery placements far back like that, it's less likely they're going to be seen if an enemy moves over your base with air units very quickly to get an idea of what's going on. I mean, eventually they'll figure out that you have some and where they are if they don't initially see it through the first pass over. But, you know, it does give you that slight advantage if you just want to have one that whittles down something. Or at least something that can fire fast enough to keep um, one of your engineers busy trying to constantly heal a building or structure of some kind. Wasting much time. Until you get more where you can actually start to do damage, more damage than what an engineer can heal at once. Now, as you can see here, I'm definitely placing down shield generators, but I'm also thinking about having overlap. So some stuff gets more protection. But also, if one shield goes down and another one can be there to protect something, at least until a um, shield generator recharges and so forth. Even, I, I even have some near my, um, Air factories, even though that I know that they can have their own personal shield for that structure and so forth. So, I believe by the end point, I usually will end up with, say, about 400 and 30 or so, um, I believe, energy per second that I'm producing. Don't mind me cracking open my energy drink. Now, because this structure is so important up front, this land defense grid, that I call it, I'm going to need to have shields put on either side of it as well. Which I eventually do, because having to deal with a lot of artillery is, a, is an annoyance. As, I, as you can see, my first three factories, I tell one to mass-produce fighters, one to mass-produce bombers, one to mass-produce... Gunships, gunships are going to move the slowest. So once you've already engaged in combat, they probably still won't be on their way to where you're attacking. So you have to factor that in. Two, you also got to factor in the fact that um, when they do arrive, they don't do crazy maneuvers. They just hover and fire directly at a unit rather than bombers that do some weird aerial... Aerial, like, acrobatics when they're, like, moving around trying to avoid getting hit while also shooting down targets. I'd also like to note these last six, um, energy generators I put here also have engineer towers on them. So, so it also kind of also gives healing to air units that fly over, but it's much closer to the land than the, the land defense grid, so, um... It also has its perks there. Now, as you can see, I have this here. I'm essentially building up my base for the sake of knowing that at the beginning, I will not be able to have the numbers to attack, surround, or divide my opponent. Only advantage I have is making use of the hard points and AA turrets I have at my disposal at my own base. Combine that with the forces that I have in in and around my base from the get-go. So, now that this is here, I believe this is where I start playing out, putting in more AA guns, because definitely want to add the protection. 
I know it, this seems like annoying, like, I'm gonna be the most annoying player to take out, but it's literally one of the worst... This is the worst case scenario if you're outnumbered by this much, but then again, I went into this knowing that it'd either be a great lesson in learning how to develop a strategy G to actually counter this, or to actually see if an interpretation of uh, the art of war that I that I have on this scenario would actually apply here, such as the one that I'm going that I'm showing here is about they may outnumber me overall in a three to one army army wise if they have the same number of buildings to units because they all count towards the same 500 unit limit. So assuming they have the same ratio as me, they outnumber me 3 to 1 overall. Now the question is, when I attack, specific point at which I'm doing so, am I outnumbering them 5 to 1? Does that mean I can attack them? Am I outnumbering them 10 to 1? Does that mean I have the opportunity to surround them? Does it start out as a 5 to 1 or a 10 to 1, but will quickly change once they send units to support them? Probably. But given the fact they're land units and they're very slow and these people did not want to use when to go full on land maybe it was because they knew it would be a little bit more difficult but they just wanted to show off that they were bad and almighty like strategist or whatever i don't know generally i do not get the concept of it of why you would want to do that like i feel like land is the worst one here but now I'm now that I mention it, I forgot to mention that we don't have actual water here, so you can't actually use a navy. I mean, if you're limited, you don't really matter because your army units just cover on water anyway, so. Your army is also your navy in this point, but they can't also, but they cannot also be your air force, so. But you get the picture. So now that I have this in this unique strategy, which I tend to like. I tend to like, and I also like having the 20 minute rush timer because it forces us to use end game tactics rather than just rushing with like 20 tanks at the beginning. Winner takes all kind of stuff because I actually want to have time to develop and move and make maneuver units and actually learn how to use more tactics. It gives you more of a chance to learn what the units at your disposal can actually do in the long run over a course of multiple games. Now, as you can see here, I still want to convert mass, but I don't want to con but I don't have enough to convert 20,000 at one point, which is 20,000 energy to mass, which is what you get when you use eight mass extractors. Because 5,000 is two, 10,000 is four, 8,000 is 20,000, and so forth. So, now, I probably, at the beginning, built maybe one or two more engineers than what I actually need. But that's usually a good thing, because you, if one dies, you can just have someone else take its position without having to stop the factory from making air units, just to make another engineer to do something. This is actually good, although you won't have to really... It's always good to have this as a backup, but if you have a lot of shields, you won't really need to actually put that into practice. But on the rare chance that that somehow happens because they want to hyper focus and target an engineer rather than dealing with the defenses, probably um, protecting it and waste 50 units to destroy one of your engineers. God forbid why you want to waste units in such a manner. Who knows? But that does make sense. Now, as you can see, I'm starting to pause stuff because they actually want to, when I convert energy, actually have enough mass to make a nuke. Defense missile or an anti nuke, I believe. My nuke defense style. So here's what what you gotta do and understand is that when this happens, when you want to make something that has a lot of mass, and you want to convert and then immediately buy it. You will run out of the energy for it, but you'll probably meet the mass requirement unless you wait until it gets over the amount required. So if I'm converting. 20,000 mass, and I know the thing's gonna cost, like, maybe a thousand, if, or a little bit over that, like, 1,500 energy for the thing I want to buy afterwards. 
maybe wait until it's like at 25,000, convert to 20,000, use the energy you have left over, because we're probably going to spend it on something else like building, I don't know, an energy generator. At this point, I really don't need it as I have 429 for a second. And we're off! Right here. I'm going to move my air units downwards at an angle. See those air units right here. Right here. These air units here. They're going to go and they're going to attack me. You see, I don't. it's kind of hard to count out how many there are there. But as Sun Tzu says, if you're not paying attention to the enemies and when you surround them, do we have enough for that? Hell no. No, we do not. We have enough to attack them. Probably not, so we shouldn't engage there. Do we have enough to divide them? I mean, it does look like we have a lot here, but it, what it boils down to is air-to-air -air combat. Like, if we want to take out these air units, we have to have fighters. And this is 47 total of fighters, bombers, and gunships. The bombers and gunships don't have AA capabilities. They don't have air-to-air -air combat capabilities. So in this scenario... What I do is I make use of earthworks, in, or in this case, of what's available at my base. So what I do is I make them think I'm going to engage, pull back to my base, and let the I added effect of what, of some of the AA guns that I have there, take effect, also the shields, and also the engineering towers, which help heal my units. And this gives me the advantage, because... This battle ends up being more or less on a one-to-one -one ratio of enemy units versus my units. But I make use of the advantage that I have, which is my base and what I built in terms of defenses for it. And he swallows the bait. This actually was kind of similar to the 3v1 that I wanted to recreate but didn't do. But they definitely did send out air units. But they didn't do it like this. I really wish I was recording it. But you see? Pull back. Once they're over my base. I tell them to go for the fighters, I believe. And then sweep up the gunships last. I mean, we have gun... Sh I knew they had gunships. And I knew maybe we were going to lose, like, a mass converter. Or maybe... Uh, one energy generator. But... We really need not worry. And then you have all of this here. Now, the reason I'm moving my units down here, even though I know I do not have enough to get them, it's about intel and vision. So you see these gray dots here? That one over the energy, over the mass extraction site is awfully mass extractor. We have different ones. That indicate different types of units. So at the very least, I know that they could be a one of a few different units. So I have the intel that there are units there. I don't have vision to see exactly which one it is. But that is fine with me. Because you see, once I have at least intel, I can be like, to my artillery units, fire at these things and rain hellfire on them. All right. Down to pull back. And I did lose two shield generators in the last one. But hey, no one's perfect. Now at any point I could totally force my opponents to not only when they use land forces, but also force them to divide their units when they don't necessarily need to. Because every t because I as long as they know that I'm only using an air force, they have to separate part of their land forces to not take out my land defenses, but to have AA. Because if they don't, I can easily annihilate their land forces that much faster than the massive amounts of artillery I'm using here. So I'm not in a pos so I'm outnumbered, but I'm putting myself in a position to where I'm forcing them to divide their own units. I'm living at the expense of my enemy. And that is what wins me these engagements of these first few land invasions that have been attempted at my base. 
I will tell you though, when I, the scenario I'm trying to recreate, the players here were like livid when I like when I when I took them out, but you know. It does pay off in the end. Eventually, you'll see me group together three things, usually. I'll usually have a group for mass converters, long-range artillery, and nuke defense silos. All my land, all my short-range artillery is right next to each other, so I just double-click, and I really do that. I don't really need to make a group for it. I can just tell them to do so. Now, here's the thing. It shows vision... But that's my last, my latest up-to-date vision. So it only shows that these units are here because I saw them there. Once something becomes vision, in some cases, it no longer switches and permanently becomes intel. So we still have vision here, even though that not many of my units are in vision range, but are in still in intel range that they're there. Once they leave, once they become part of vision, but leave vision and intel range, then it's an unknown. I believe. Seeing as these were mostly fighters, I ended up doing this. Now, I don't believe anything interesting happened other than a minute issue with my settings that I had to change. Because I might have rebinded the wrong key for um, the rotation and I couldn't figure it out. <laughs> Mid-battle, it kind of sucked. But then again, I'm glad this didn't happen in the scenario I, in the original game I was playing that I'm trying to recreate here. Because just because I paused doesn't mean the gamer, the other ones stop. All right. And then, as you notice here, I accidentally made more than I intended because I thought I made 10 to begin with. But this factory started producing some, so I ended up having to self-destruct. It sucks, but, you know. What can you do? Now, what's so deadly about this type of strategy is the amount of long-range artillery I'm using slowly will sound a base faster than it can probably rebuild. Unless you have... Unless it starts out on a base that already has, like, three engineers, they're all spread out, they're all rebuilding stuff and healing stuff at a faster rate. But it's likely they probably don't have that. And plus, that would only be a band-aid. One thing you really got to look out for is actually building a massive amount of shields to prevent yourself from being artillery bombarded. Like I did. And right here, pretty much after I built in these, or told my players to lay down the blueprints for the nuke defense, for the nuke silos, because I already have the nuke defense silos, it's literally nothing but um, AA emplacements and shield generators. Of course, this made the people here question my insanity. And if I have any, if I took the amount of time to develop a strategy like this, but then again, what are you supposed to do when you lock yourself in your room all day? Trying to avoid toxic people and your family in life. Eh, whatever. Anyway. So when I did do this, it was kind of actually quite good here because I know what I what I'm doing is essentially at no matter what so long as I have these artillery long range artillery I'm living at their expense of their bases and I'm living at the expense of their ground forces that are attacking because I have to force them to divide because they either have to have enough land forces to even think it's worth attempting 
to attack my land defense grid, which is still being in construction, but it does get towards completion. But then you also have to factor in the fact that I have an Air Force, so they actually have to buy that between that and the AA, and it's like, what's the point? Now, does this strategy have a weakness that they could possibly overrun me with if they all ganged up with the Air Forces? Probably, but at the same time, I could easily end up with a similar result. But I don't hard focus on making bombers and uh, gunships because all I just need to do is take out the AA and then I'm good. But then it will force them to make their land units. But if I have the land defense grid, I'm kind of solid there and they just don't need to build the AA. But even still, it is quite an effective tool. Now, because this doesn't, uh, because these structures cannot move, they're still inside my intel range. So, they're still treated as if I have vision on them because they were once vision but never moved out of my intel range. So, now that I move in here, I see it's done a bigger of a number on my forces than I thought. So, then I try and tell these scouts to move out. I knew that they'd probably get destroyed, but this lets me know how I'm doing. And I tell them to redirect towards what is what they need to be shooting at. Now, here's the thing. I see this land force here. I know they're severely weakened in their base down below. Now, if I don't have to deal with all the turrets and stuff that I have here probably defending. Defending just two mass extractors. I'm probably good and it wouldn't be worth it to do that engagement. Given the fact that I'm running Hellfire down on them. I just want to send it to their base. Send a message and take out this air force because I know it's a pain in the butt. They're hard focusing on air. And this land force here still probably has a bunch of AA in it, thinking that at some point I'm going to just bombard it, my air force. So at least a portion, maybe a third or a quarter of those land forces are, are AA, which won't do damage to my land defense grid. But I probably is the first time here that I actually tell them to switch to hard points. With the massive amount of energy that I stored up, which is currently exceeding max at the top, the 99,999 or whatever. And right here is a good example of this base raid that I'm doing. Overall, from the get-go, and overall at most, assuming they reach max unit limit, they all number me 3 to 1. That doesn't mean jack squat when you consider the fact that I actually outnumbered this base at at least a 5 to 1 ratio. Now, this does take out some of my shields with this attack, but it's only two. I can easily rebuild. Now, I believe they're just outside the range of these energy generators here. And that kind of sucks. They didn't actually get the healing like the ones up here would get because there's two of them here. So, eventually we will get to a point where I'll probably figure out a way to actually squish one in there a little bit closer. Eventually. And I tell my Air Force units that right in the base to finish this off, but still leave some here. Just in case, for whatever reason, I might need these at my base. In the event something goes wrong. A good tactician always, always keeps something hidden and withdrawn. Because you never know if your enemies, if your allies... To view you as your enemies and trying to keep you close. Always have something in reserve. I see that engineer there. And that engineer will allow the green faction to rebuild. And I'm like, no. I take that out, then I go back, and then I focus on the factories and so forth. And this is pretty much where one out of three the fall.
Because the red and yellow forces keep sending land forces to attack me, my land defense grid, and knowing that I have air force, I'm essentially dividing them and living at their, at their expense that they have to be divided despite the fact they outnumber me. They are essentially commanding their army to advance or retreat, being ignorant of the fact that they cannot obey the command to actually destroy this. They're essentially just sending their men out to die and hobbling their army. And that is something I do capitalize on in the long run. Not so much in the short run to begin with, because I didn't have a whole lot of the land defense grid set up yet. As I call it, I think that's what I've been calling it. I don't know, I just made up a name for it at, from the get-go, for the sake of the video. But yeah. Now at this point, I could literally just hunker down and just carpet nuke them if I want, but that's going to take forever to convert all the mass, all this stuff. Plus, it's going to keep spending, expending mass and whatnot that could be used for shield generators and stuff. Plus, I'm not really quite at that point yet, but I'm at the point where I could get there if I wanted to solely focus on it. But I definitely do use a few here. I mean, I technically could have the game run a little bit longer and not use it, or maybe do, depending upon how many you want to make, depending upon the strategy of hit and run with the, with your Air Force on nuke defense silos and then nuke, or if you want to just um, build, like, five nuke defense silos, build a total of 25 nukes, and then just carpet nuke it in one area and let one get through at least. I believe they can fire four in rapid succession. I noticed that the fifth one takes some time to unload and usually gets the hidden, depending upon how far away it is from the from the radius from where the where the nuke defense silo actually protects them versus where it's actually landing. So if it's like right on top of it, it will take it out. So it really depends. Now, when you look at the land defense grid, you're probably thinking, oh, you just airdrop units in there, air transit. I have a huge air force. That that counters that weakness. I understand that that's a weakness at first when I made this strategy. I actually lost quite a few battles with this, but I learned from my mistake. I actually made it like this. I actually understand why this is very effective now from past mistakes. Now I want to attack this. So I'm really not sure what the mindset was here because I believe I could go with either or for attacking. I thought maybe it was possible that the reason I went for red is because it's further away and when I um, told him to attack with my artillery at the bridge here and stuff would be easier to do. Because I'd have less to worry about because they're so farther away. And crippling them would be easier because it would be harder for me to take out any long-range artillery. Seeing as I don't have as many shield generators as I would like to feel comfortable from being bombarded with multiple long-range artillery. So from the get-go... From this battle, I see a lot of projectiles being arced, fired. It's not doing much. I originally told my long-range artillery to fire at the red stuff on the bridge, but I kind of swapped over to the yellow, knowing that if I bombard them, that some of their forces would get caught in the crossfire coming over here. And I pretty much just put myself in a position to where I just need to sit and wait. Now, as you can see, they are moving experimentals close to my base. And that's when I really deal with them and lay down the heavy fire. But I quickly tell these to take them out. And then I realize that I should probably swap over to hardpoint mode or whatever it's called. Or hardened uh, artillery mode. I can't remember the exact name of the research thing. For the experimentals, but I noticed they were destroyed, but then I see two more on the way. You 
Now I could bombard the area where I just attacked with my air forces here. But that makes no sense with my long range artillery. Yes, it prevents them from building there, but they don't currently have stuff there. And that means I'm not living at their expense via artillery and only living at the expense of them through the method of dividing their forces between land units and land AA in terms of what can destroy my defenses. Whether it be a defense via my air force or through my land defense grid. All right. So now that I wipe this up, this seems like a place where I know some engineers would probably rummage through here and try and grab some extra mass. But I mean, given the fact that they'll probably, when they're done attacking whatever I tell them to, they'll probably just target them because they're in range and I'm raining down heavy artillery fire. And it's not going to do much. This does provide me intel on what they have in terms of nuke defense silos in the front of the base if I just want to tell them to target this. But after I attack that stuff, I just go back. And then when they're done, I just... I'm probably going to retell my long range to retarget stuff. Or mass convert, I can't remember off the top of my head. But either one works in this position because I know... I have the time to do it, and I can expend the energy without knowing that I'm going to need to um, spend the energy to temporarily boost my short-range artillery to take out any um, any uh, experimental mechs that they send their way. Now, I do want to make a few more shield generators, but I know I'm at max units, but I know that given the amount of artillery I have... Units don't really matter to an extent as long as I have a set amount. And I'm well over that in terms of being able to launch an attack on someone. Outnumbering them in the 5 to 1 ratio. Once I whittle down their numbers via the artillery range. So, you'll see that here eventually. That I need to get rid of some of my units somehow. And this is the result. But in a real strategic scenario, if you have the resources, you're going to do it. And it's not really going to matter about... How many units you have really IRL if this was an IRL situation, but this is just a video game, so. Not only is my defense good because I'm defending something that I know will be attacked and I'm succeeding, I'm also allowing myself the time to attack something without it being well defended like a siege, like a castle siege where I know I'm guaranteed to lose like a third or a tenth of my men depending upon the situation at hand. Because whenever you're sieging a fort of some kind with a physical structure, that's going to cost you manpower. Like, you're already going to accept that there are going to be some form of casualties. Maybe a tenth or a third of your army. Given the fact that you don't really have walls, castle walls like they did in medieval Europe here, and you're just bombing the crap out of stuff with an air force, it's really not that much of a difference. You're just accepting that uh, some of your fighters from the get-go are going to get shot down by the AA emplacements as they attack your air-to-air -air first and for all of your other air units and so forth. Now I get my fifth and final nuke silo online and I told them to make nukes. And I tell them to wait off to the side because I don't want them to take the brunt of the AA that this land force will have. But then I'm like, I should probably move them down here. Out and around, I've probably dealt enough damage to actually take out Red Base. Given my, given my current situation of starting out in a 1v3 that is now a 1v2. I move in... And I tell it to wipe out as much as I can. If there were nuke defense silos or nuke silos, I probably would have taken them out as well. 
as you can see, everything around this nuke defense silo right around here is gone, but not that. So they probably spent a lot of time and resources healing it to make sure it still stood. But you get the picture. I also believe here I also heavily targeted their and the enemy ACU for this faction. That way they could uh, not make use of all the benefits that you get from it. From all the combat benefits to the building faster and all that stuff. I believe I do it in this raid or the next one. But if you can recognize that this is an advantage you have. That, that will help you long term as they cannot make another one if you destroy the escape pod. Unfortunately, because this was a 3v1 and they agreed to have all research unlocked to begin with, and I'm like, might as well. I actually decided that that would be a great idea because they aerated me after the 20 minute mark and took out my ACU. It's not going to, at the very least, blow up half my base. No, actually, that wouldn't work because typically I try to make sure that I actually have core dump research before 20 minutes. At least one anti nuke and a nuke defense silo with four other nuke defense silos set up for at least a total of 5 by 20 minutes. They're as close to it as I can. Depending upon what I'm able to make use of, depending upon the map. Alright. So I know I have to take out all of their units to win. So that's what I'm doing. I'm just mopping up here, checking out all of this. I'm well aware they have better... They have better defense capabilities and better structures on the bridge. But I am going to get rid of that eventually. But I think this hurts them more as they're, like, literally only have accessible to... Three... Best extractors now. Compared to the six they had on that base and the three on the bridge for a total of nine. Now for me, you might be wondering, I have three mass extractor sites on my bridge. Why didn't I make use of them? Well, I'm going to tell you why. The amount of resources I have to spend to constantly rebuild them there, they get constantly destroyed. I don't remember them. Best thing to do is hunker down, put, my, put the base itself in a position to where it cannot lose. I do not think I'd have the resources or the capabilities in this situation to do that for the same three mass extractors that would be placed on the bridge itself. I don't have enough room for enough emplacement shields and so forth. That's what's the blame because they could easily get around it and go to my base directly with the Air Force units anyway. And I don't have access to them for 20 minutes. And at that point, I might as well just try and secure everything that's behind the land defense grid anyway. Moving over here, I take out one of the last few engineers that I see. Realizing that they're not quite done yet, they're probably either back at the place where they started with their base. Or back at this place as they moved over here to just at least try and save them face. And then I realize, yeah, they have units there. But, rather than doing that, I'm like, my Air Force can definitely mop it up in the night. Tell my, um, Long Range Artillery to start living at the expense of another enemy. Not the one that's about to be destroyed, of course, but yellow faction and so forth. And I think that was a glitch because the shield didn't show up right away, the shield generator. Even though I was right over it, so I should technically have vision... And intel on it, but who knows. 
why it did that. Maybe it was a visual glitch, or maybe it didn't render in because of the settings I have with my GPU. Who knows? Either way, I had Intel on it, even though that I should have had Vision, but it doesn't matter. I can still target it with my Air Force as long as I have Intel, so I'm not going to bother. Now you tell them to make another one. When I tell these ones to actually nuke this thing right here. Because I have an inkling that they're going to send a land force towards me. And I'm like, this would just totally, utterly destroy their stuff? Great. Not have to deal with, I'd have to deal with one less wave that would attack my base. Even though that I could already confidently say with what I have at my base, it would be rendered useless. Do them. And if you look, you can see they were moving forces. If I waited, say, 15 more seconds, this game probably would have ended maybe 10, 15 minutes faster than it actually did. Maybe not 10, but more closer to 5 to 7 minutes faster. I'm gonna give the, I'm gonna give the benefit of the doubt that they actually had some capability to actually put up some form of resistance in some way, shape, or form, or you gotta at the very least assume so. Now, I'm not sure why. Yellow left all of these units here. But definitely not having to worry about them there. Possibly a sneak attack of some kind, activating some ability that I didn't think of. Although I don't think they'd be able to reach my base from there. Not sure why they did it. Now I see that they have an engineer that's coming from this platform. I know they probably built up something there. Most likely AA emplacements, hard points, shield generators. And mass extract is probably my best guess. It looks like he built four mass extractors. From what I can see here. And because he left them unprotected, I quickly and easily them out. And I turn all my uh, all my short range are turned into hard points. And that immediately gunned down that encryptor mech experimental. So I like to point out, cost me 16,000 energy, but when you make 492 a second, that's chunk change in terms of resources. My units were never lost due to a lack of supplies. They were never asked to be commended to advance or treat being ignorant of the fact that they could not obey. I never attempted to administrate them as if I would a kingdom. And I never um, installed an officership in the army without discrimination through the ignorance of the military principle adaptation to circumstance. I forced my opponents into situations where they had to do it to varying degrees of extents for each one of those three, and that gave me an advantage. Once I knew Red was fully destroyed, I knew I was going to have a tough time building this, attacking this base. It's going to be heavily guarded and all this stuff. Hence why I told it to... Hence why when I moved in here, and then told it to move out, I wanted to give some time for my artillery to, like, rearrange and be like, Hey... What we were bombing before no longer exists now. Let's bombard this thing. That's base. And that's what eventually happens here. Now, as you can see, I'm about to launch a nuke, but I'm also going to do so knowing that I took out a nuke defense silo. Now, as far as I know, when I quickly glanced over, I did not see that they lost one. Now you tell them to remake another nuke. Random nukes for the same reason. And that noise alone tells me all I need to know. 
At least one out of the five that I hit was not intercepted by a nuke, by an anti-nuke. That's why I usually fire them in volleys of five. Knowing that I have some form of an advantage. Me realizing what I did with all these extra units here. That I made. I destroy some of them, but I do believe I keep some of them for the sake of, um... Healing units faster. Even though the energy generators do have, um, their own thing, I believe. Have their own engineering towers to do the same thing that the engineers are doing here in terms of healing. So now that I've launched the nukes, they're probably not even close to fully recovering from it yet. And that just tells me there's a base that needs to be finished off. And I know they're in a position to where I could expend my whole army, have them all die on their base, but I'll know that I do enough damage to ensure that they can't recover from it, especially on top of all the artillery. But I don't want to be wasteful of an army in that manner. Well, I typically try to take out what is the biggest threat to me. Which, for some reason, I believe was... Not their army, so I didn't really need to worry about them with their mass extractors and their energy generators and their factories building units because they just did the land armies and that did not do nothing to my base. I believe I focused on their nuke defense silos because I really wanted to just for the fun, just for funsies nuke them again. As you can see, I take out those two experimentals. Of my land defense grid and yeah now I know what you're saying in regards to what some people are gonna say what about the a units your land factors can Attack. I mean, yeah, but it's not going to do that much when I outnumber them to a 5 to 1. Eventually, I'm going to destroy them before they permanently wipe out anything. Then I notice in the back here that they have a nuke defense silo. I really just want to four funsies nuke them again, which was accurate to the scenario I'm trying to recreate that I didn't record at the time in multiplayer. Which I really wish I did, but you get the picture. Then I see that I have the nuke ready, so then I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to nuke that. And then when I see that, I tell them to retreat back here, Then I'm probably going to tell them to attack uh, something that isn't inside their base, so I did. Now I can confirm that those hit, I probably could have aimed it a little bit closer to their factories. I realize the most important thing now, because I took out what would be known as their last uh, unit production, is to take out their um, engineers so they couldn't rebuild anything. Can't rebuild more units because they don't have nothing to build factories to make air units, land units, and so forth. Once I take that out, they can't do much because they can't even use resources because they have nothing to build mass extractors or energy generate. So the most important thing here, despite the fact that there's like eight eight or so like units down here, is to take out this one engineer. Which it's a race between my air force and my artillery. My artillery ends out ends up destroying it before my air force does. And that essentially terminates their any chance of them winning. And that is how I took advantage, a disadvantage of numbers. And I turned it into a victory. And I made sure when I, that even though that overall I was outnumbered, where it mattered most, I outnumbered them. I lived at the enemy's expense. Made sure my units were never without a supply. A supply train of energy and mass, and I made use of the fact of the earthworks of geothermal borehole by 
making sure that the choke point that is the bridge to my base would be lined with short-ranged artillery, preventing them from dividing me because overall they did not have the numbers to attack or surround but enough to divide me in accordance with Sun in accordance with the writings of Sun Tzu's Art of War. I'd just like to point out this is a new take on my strategy guide series where rather than me doing giving commentary as I play the game, which kind of divides my focus, I'd rather go back and commentate over it what I'm doing here. I do mention it in the actual video itself where I just recorded and then I record a little intro and then mute my mic and so forth. But this is a scenario I recreated. I know these are just bots that I'm playing against, but this did work with players, and it was about, I'd say about 85% of what they did was kind of accurate to what, what the players did. There's some varying differences, but I can't, it's not like I'm going to know what they're going to do from the get-go. I mean, if, if I did, it really wouldn't be much of a challenge or fun. If I knew what the bots were going to do when they did before it even happened kind of thing anyway. But hopefully you learn something on how to apply this adaptation of the, or this adaptation and viewpoint of the writings of Sun Tzu's Art of War that I apply to this particular scenario that I ended up finding myself in, which kind of sucked. I'm, I'm not sure why, why they didn't want DLC units. I don't know, but they were also gun and hell about not having research. Now, what am I going to complain? I mean, yeah, it's either going to defeat me faster because they don't have to spend time researching, or it's going to benefit me because I don't have to do the same. And while I found out which one it was, even though it seems like it would be more of a benefit to them. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed watching this video. Take some time to leave any comments, questions, or feedback in the comment section down below. It would be highly appreciated, and I will see you all in the next War Room meeting. Bye!